great privilege and pleasure for me to be here, and I'm grateful to all of you who have made it possible. I think I should, first of all, confess that I'm not a doctor. But in printing the program down here, you had such an impressive list of speakers, the composer could not resist putting the degree in front of my name, and for that, I am uh, grateful, and I think I shall take considerable ribbing from my friends at home for a long time to come. As I look around this auditorium tonight, and as I remember other meetings, it seems obvious that there are a great deal of travel is involved in your coming here. And certainly there is considerable distance separating the homes of your speakers from the location of this mission. And I wonder why we come. I wonder if we come because of the editorials in the newspaper or because of the local publicity given to it in the churches or because of a feeling of community pride and public spirit and we're going to fill that auditorium. I don't think that's why we come at all. I don't think we come because anybody asked us to. I think we can say we are here tonight because it was for this we were created and for this we were given freedom of choice. And you and I can remember the words of our Lord when his mother was chiding him for remaining behind in the temple and he said, Woman, wist ye not that I must be about my father's business? And as God's unworthy, faltering, and oftentimes unwilling servants, you and I, too, must be about our Father's business. For we are commanded to work and to pray and to give for the spread of Christ's kingdom on earth. And our Lord has provided to us the means of grace and the hope of glory and the promise of redemption and salvation if we exercise our faith. And if we fail to exercise it, then like an unused muscle, it will wither and atrophy. And God's time is infinite, but you and I have only a few fleeting seconds, and we dare not postpone until tomorrow the witness we should make today. Now, among the conflicting ideologies and philosophies and economic theories, it would almost appear there is only one point of agreement in our world today, if we look around us. Almighty God exists only in the minds of men too weak or too emotionally unstable to face life without this fictional prop. And Jesus Christ was not the Son of God, and the Christian Church is a quasi-political organization peopled with hypocrites and pretenders. And the resurrection was nothing but a hoax and a fake perpetrated by a group of ignorant, superstitious men. Now, you and I angrily reject that thesis. It offends you that I say those words on this platform, and it's offensive to me, but this is the postulate of the pagan world. What then is the alternative or the antithesis? Why, that man was indeed created by God, the Father Almighty, who in fact did make heaven and earth and who so loved the world he gave his only begotten son for you and for me. And we remember that scene in the garden when two of his disciples had returned from the village and they were reporting the latest rumor, the, the scuttlebutt in the town. And our Lord said, well, what, what's, what do you hear? And one said, well, some say you're a prophet and some other people think you're Elias. And another man said, well, some say you're John the Baptist. And our Lord said, But who say ye that I am? And they answered, Thou art Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And to that affirmation you and I can add our risen Lord. And if this is the premise, if this is the antithesis you and I accept, if these things be true, we dare not continue to exhibit no more than a passive acquiescence to the everlasting truth of Almighty God. For you and I are challenged by an awesome responsibility. We are God's missionary outpost. We're the Christian commandos. We're the frogmen, the jet pilots. We're God GI, God's GIs. And could you trust the future of your creation to such as we? 
If God's church were strong, would it be forced to crawl on its knees and beg for pennies? If God's church were powerful, would its teachings be disregarded by the political state? If we truly believed what we say we believe, would we not cry out in pain and anguish against the indifference and the apathy and the selfishness and the greed of our totally self-centered materialistic society? The impact of that first Easter touched the lives of a handful of simple fisher folk. And the irresistible power of the living God made of them such compelling witnesses they transformed an entire world. And the Son of God speaks to you and to me, demanding an answer to that eternal question. But whom say ye that I am? And if we were challenged tonight to find one descriptive phrase which would be adequate to our particular era in history, a number of suggestions would immediately present themselves. Man has triumphed over his material surroundings. We have exploited the usefulness of coal and gasoline and now the atom, and we might call this an age of mechanical power. Then in the past two decades, man has penetrated the secret of the atom, and we've used it for both destructive and constructive purposes. And so we might call this the atomic age. But most recently, we've flung two little satellites out into the ionosphere, and we might, because of that, call this the age of outer space. But when we mention outer space, it's almost invariably coupled with dire prophecies and predictions of death and destruction. And the power of the atom cannot affect or stay the hand of death. And in the magnificent scientific accomplishments of our last 10 years, our culture appears to be feeding its own little individual ego on a sort of intellectual and spiritual and moral mill town. We blame the government or the church or big business or politics or the unions or any other agency which appears to be handy and convenient. And surely the objective historian looking back upon this period in man's fumbling forward progress will describe what we have experienced as the fearful fifth. We're the seekers. We're enchanted by somatic gymnastics, and we hope to find some new technology, some new idea of government, or some new philosophy which will, when superimposed upon our culture, answer all of our problems. We're quite willing to accept all the benefits of a Judeo-Christian civilization without inquiring into its foundations. We're quite willing to accept all of the obvious benefits of the church, so long as the church isn't too demanding, so long as it doesn't interfere in our own little day-to-day -day activities. And so long as you and I manage to keep God safely on the periphery of our lives, so long as our churches are content to allow us to occupy ourselves with busy work, and so long as we can rationalize our comfortable ease, so long will the terror and agony of the fearful 50s remain the central characteristic of our society and our culture. Here in the midst of plenty, we conjure the specter of famine. Our storehouses are bulging, and last week all of the headlines across the nation carried the news of a bread line in one isolated little town. We have the accumulation and interchange of knowledge which has never been equal in all of man's experience. And we join in an hysterical downgrading of the educational processes and pretend to see a total failure in all that we have done. Now, if these things I've outlined be true, if we are a nation that is frightened and unsure and full of complexes and hysteria, then you and I must accept a portion of the responsibility for man's predicament. What then shall we say to these things? Are we to find a new political philosophy or a new economic system or even a new kind of 
religion to answer this. 6,000 years of recorded history testify to man's inability to find the answer to any of these problems within the limits of his own resources. For our problem lies not in a system of economics or philosophy or education or in a doctrine of political organization. Our problem is man's ego, man's greed, man's willfulness. And the question you and I must face and answer is not one of altering the structures of society. It is, may I suggest, an individual problem to be faced by each one of us individually. For you and I must answer that question, whom say ye that I am? We say we believe in God the Father Almighty and in his Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But if we truly believe, would we do what we do? Would we live as we live? But remember in the Acts of the Apostles, the last instruction our Lord gave us was that when the power of the Holy Ghost shall come upon you, then ye shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and under the ends of the earth. A meeting such as this and every service and every church and every element of worship is a portion of that witnessing. St. Paul says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith ye are called. And because you and I are weak and vain and ambitious, we turn aside from that true vocation. Dr. Evans at noon was talking today at the theater about Christ in our work, about men who become Christ-centered rather than self-centered. And you and I cannot do God's work until we become his servants. And because this is a person-to-person -person relationship between man and his creator, the first requirement is unconditional surrender. To be God's servant, we must first of all strengthen and nourish our own faith until the birth and the life and the crucifixion and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ becomes the central fact in our day-to-day -day lives. Is Christmas an annual event confused with tinsel bows and happy gifts and colored lights? If you and I are to be his true witnesses, under the ends of the earth, then Christ will be born again each day in the hearts of men. St. Paul says, faith is the evidence of things unseen, the substance of things hoped for, and faith is the greatest gift of all, and it's offered to all of us if we seek it. All who will accept it and nourish it, but we can expect failure if we hope to do this on the standard procedure of one hour each Sunday in some church. For if that's the degree of our commitment, then we're exactly one 168th committed. Oh, we can improve that fraction of our daily lives if we serve on vestries or chapters or become members of the governing board of our particular church or participate in the drive for financial support or work in a mission such as this Johnson City teaching mission. And I assure you it's a very comfortable thing if we can limit our contemplation of God's mercy to just one hour on Sunday and a few extra hours in the week because the closer you and I develop our personal relationship, the more desperately we become aware of our own inadequacies and our own failures and our insufficiencies prod us day and night. Yet, if we're even nominally Christian, we acknowledge the presence of God when our children are baptized into the blessed company of all faithful people. And we seek God's blessing when we're confirmed in our particular church, and we ask his help when we're married, and we seek his healing grace when we're ill, and we rest on his comforting promise when our loved one dies. And if it's useful to man to seek God's presence during these solemn moments of our lifetime, would it not then be also useful to have God with us in our daily lives 
in our businesses, in our professions, in our play, in our recreation. I shall never forget a night on the south coast of California. There were perhaps 25 people from my inland city on the desert who gathered over there to enjoy the coolness of the ocean and the refreshing salt water. This was one of those sort of uh, everybody get together and say hello. And we were having a picnic on the beach, and my host was a disreputable character. And this was a gay party. And he had salt in his hair and the, the most uh, uh, unpresentable pair of bathing trunks I think I've ever seen. And he asked that question, which is so often asked at parties like that. And he said, is everybody happy? Well, you know the answer. Of course we were happy. And we shouted in unison that we were happy. And then he said, let's thank God for that happiness. And he said, we thank thee, God, for gay and grateful hearts. Nothing will happen in this personal relationship between you and God or me and God until we make that first step. For thanks to the love and grace of Almighty God, one is the magic number. And you are the important individual immortal soul Christ was seeking on the cross. And we're commanded to extend Christ's kingdom on earth, and how can we extend that which we do not possess ourselves? And once we do possess it, we cannot keep still about it. In a world which is hungry for the comfortable gospel of Christ. The normal response is to say, well, this is fine for a preacher or for a doctor who deals in healing the sick or for a social service worker or for someone who's day-to-day earn-the-living occupation brings them in touch with people who are constantly in need. Two months ago, I spent three hours at a great naval base with a young commander. This man has five youngsters ranging in age from 12 down to two. He sailed 365,000 miles in World War II and the Korean War in command of various vessels and a good bit of that time on a, on a destroyer. He had more sea duty than anybody on this base. He was telling me about a new assignment. He said overseas in the South Pacific. We're going to set up a training center. We're going to send over a team of officers and men to instruct the peoples of that area how to use the materiel and the weapons and the things we're sending them. And it's a six-month assignment. And he said, I wouldn't be tapped for this because I have all this more sea duty than, than the captain. But yesterday I asked my skipper if I might have that assignment. And this seemed an odd and peculiar thing to me, and I wondered if he was having trouble with his wife or why he wanted to get away from this delightful shore berth. And I said, why in the world? And he said, how can the peoples of the world ever understand our country unless they deal with men who are first of all Christians. And so in that island of the far South Pacific, Commander Jerry Ray Hill will be his witness unto the ends of the earth. I have another friend who's involved in a, an industry which lends a great deal of money to a great many people. And in the legislature of his particular state, a bill had been introduced a bill which was calculated to produce a response from this industry and a payoff to the two or three or four poorly motivated men who were using their position as members of that legislature to, to extort from this group. And at this industry meeting, the president of the association said, well, our, our problem is plain and the solution is simple. We will assess all our members so much money and we'll go out and we know the five or six men, and it will only take two or three hundred dollars a piece, and our trouble will be over. And my friend stood up and said, this legislation is evil. It is motivated by impure and uh, grasping and conniving men, and it would do a great damage not only to our industry but to all the people in this state and to many satellite sections of the economy, such as the building trades and the material suppliers. 
and it must be stopped. And I will work 10 or 12 or 15 hours a day if necessary, and I'll cover the entire state, and I'll pay whatever is necessary as my share of advertising time or television time or newspaper space to defeat this legislation, but I will not contribute one dollar to a payoff. Are we going to descend to their level? And there was a Christian witness in the market. I have a friend who recently recovered from a severe heart attack. And before his heart attack, he was an active man participating in all of the community affairs. And his schedule was the kind of schedule you all recognize as that of a busy man. Sometimes he slept three hours a night, sometimes 12. He never ate on time. He was never in a particular place on schedule. And now he lives by the book. He goes to bed at 8 o'clock. He eats his meals at a specified time, and he follows a particular diet. And he turns down all sorts of things which would intrude on that. And he says, I'm going to live because that doctor has told me what to do. And what the doctor's told him is that he might live a year or two or three years longer if he follows this routine. And he is a living witness to his faith in that doctor and his willingness to become a witness in return for that promise of perhaps a few extra years. And the Son of God walked this earth and promised eternal life to you and to me. Can we be that kind of a witness to him? In our world today, we see fear and frustration. We see men who are desperately seeking the peace of Almighty God. For 20 years, our society has been a little reluctant to mention God's name out loud in a public place. It's been something that we reserved for women and children, and strong men maybe sent a check, but they didn't participate in the Lord's work because America was bold enough and self-sufficient enough to do all these things without God's help. But as we look forward now into man's penetration of the scientific barriers, it becomes increasingly obvious that man can do none of these things by himself and that the road ahead without God's help and God's guidance and God's daily participation in our lives will lead to futility and frustration and disappointment and death. In the Bible, we find the record of the encounter between Almighty God and man. And in most of our homes, the sports page or the comics receive more attention day to day than in this living record of the appearance on our earth of Almighty God who came seeking you and me. The genius of America tonight, it seems to me, is almost entirely devoted to convincing us that one cigarette is less harmful than another. We talk about the satellites and baseball and politics and our neighbor's shortcomings and sex with the most casual of strangers. We urge those we love to join us in our pleasures and our recreation in dining and dancing and trips and experiences. How long has it been since we've asked our neighbor to join us in the worship of Almighty God? How long has it been since we've given to God a rightful share in our conversation? How long has it been since we have faced and answered that eternal question, but whom say ye that I am? being asked tonight in the hearts of all men. And men across our land are hungry to find that right relationship. And they will find it not from study or reading, but when in the language of relationship they recognize something about a Christian which is compelling and inviting. They will find it when they recognize in you and in me in our imperfect, unwilling, frequently failing individual efforts, 
a witness to Christ in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and across the earth. And the evils and the ills and the frustrations of our world will never be solved until you and I can become such witnesses to him and to his overpowering love that men and women everywhere may take knowledge of us that we have been with Jesus. Until we answer that question, Thou art the Son of God, our risen Lord. Until you and I, with a passionate affirmation and a total commitment, recognize that we too must be about our Father's business.